It's time for our next festival edition video, uh, Purim. Um, and that Jewish celebration is less than a week away uh, as we post this video on the Jewish calendar. So it's it's time to do another conversation. And we this video is, is our is our is our most recent, our latest, in a whole playlist that we've been doing now for this is this is going on three years. So every upcoming holiday we post something to reflect on, all those kinds of things. So there's a whole playlist that you can find on the YouTube channel. Um, and you can just kind of start at the beginning and work your way through that whole playlist. And we we look at different things. Um and you can go back and see last year's conversation. So we've talked before. We actually started the whole playlist with a two-part video about Purim. Um, and, and we kind of start by talking about the observance of the festivals in this, in this playlist. So we kind of spent the first year, maybe maybe first year and a half, two years, talking about the what does it look like to observe the festival. Um, we discussed things like appropriation, all that kind of stuff and how to avoid some of that. Um, and then this last year, we've been kind of reflecting on some of the content of the teaching. We've already done the observance. So now how can we reflect on what is the essence of Shavuot? What is What, what are the things we're actually talking about and learning about when it comes to the high holidays or Sukkot? Or, so we've been, we've been focused more on kind of the content of the teaching, the teaching of the holiday, the lesson of the holiday. And, um, and so Purim is obviously the story of the book of Esther. We've talked about that a few different times. In the last video, I talked really about the essence of Rabbi Foreman's, um, just some of the best material I've ever heard on the book of Esther and the story of Purim. And, and we just wrestled through the whole, like the biblical content. And in last year's video, I gave like, there's like 12 links in the description of that video places to dive deeper and study. And it was all about kind of like the biblical essence of, of the story and the lessons that we learned, the lesson to be learned in Purim. This year, I thought maybe I would reflect on some of the most practical, like let's just make this maybe a shorter conversation this year about what does this practically look like to live out the lessons of Purim. Because last year when my family celebrated Purim, we had this beautiful conversation that I thought was super practical. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. So again, if you want to review, go back to last year's video. I'll, I'll link last year's video in the description to this one. How about that? Make it easy for you. And you can, you can kind of watch that and remind yourself of the, what we talked about was what Purim teaches us and tells us is that their Esther and Mordecai, they live under Persian empire. They live in a Persian empire that is very um, pagan, very Gentile, and they're trying to live as a light to the Gentiles. They're trying to figure out how to bring, we would say things like the kingdom of God into the kingdom of Persia. How do you start to do that? And, and obviously in the story of, of Purim, uh, the Jews are, are under attack. There's a literal date that's been identified for their extermination. Um, and Esther has to deal with this. She has to save her people. Uh, she has to save her people by being unbelievably shrewd and having an unbelievable amount of wisdom. And she ends up being this model for us, her and Mordecai, but she, Esther, is this model of what it means to engage empire with shrewdness. Walter Brueggemann would call it Accommodation and Resistance. I'll put a link to his book that talks about that. It's called Out of Babylon. And I'll put a link to his book in the description of this video as well. What does it mean to engage with shrewdness and wisdom empire? Um, what does it mean to live in empire and simultaneously resist empire? That sounds easy. It's actually very, very, very difficult. And so I'll give you a couple examples. And, and, and the larger example I want to spend time with today was our family's conversation from last year's Purim. So my daughter is this beautiful human being. I love my daughter. She has such a good heart. She has such a gentle heart. And she wants to be about goodness. My daughter struggles being in a room where we're not doing the right thing. Being in a room where people aren't following the rules. My daughter struggles with that, right? 
And so last year, I can't remember if her teacher was maybe having a baby and on maternity leave or something, but her teacher was gone for quite some time. And there was a substitute uh, covering the class. And, and the kids were, you know how kids are. I know how I was when we had a substitute teacher. Um, you, are, you are not behaving. You are not giving the substitute teacher the same amount of respect that you would give your normal teacher. And you are not doing what uh, the teacher has asked. Now, my daughter knows very clearly what the teacher has asked of the class, what she's assigned the class, and what she wants the class to be doing. Um, the class is not doing this, and this is upsetting my daughter. You see where my daughter's at? Is my daughter is living in, like, uh, I'm not empire, but my daughter is living in a world, in, in like, the world not as it should be, and she wants to live in the world as it should be. She finds herself in the middle of Persia, to use a metaphor, and she's wanting to do what God desires. And so my daughter uh, emails the teacher at home and tells the teacher what's going on in her classroom. And so then the teacher responds by sending a class-wide email back to all the students telling them, to get back to work and to, uh, you know, obey the substitute and do the right things, right? Now, the class was on to my daughter. They knew because they know who my daughter is and they knew, uh, they knew. They were like, Abby, did you write the teacher? And my daughter said, yes, I did. And you can imagine, right, how many friends that made my daughter. I was actually super worried for her. I was worried she was going to be bullied or, and, and beautifully she wasn't, uh, she got out of that. I mean, the, her friends were not happy with her. Her class was not happy with her. She did not. And so this became this beautiful case study for my family last year at Purim because it was that same week that we celebrated Purim. And we said, here's the problem. If you just march into Persia and clearly state what's wrong, like, that could have easily backfired on my daughter. Like, she could have become the brunt of everybody's anger and accusation. She could have been bullied. She could have, she wasn't, but she could have been. That could have gone sideways in a big hurry. And it never changed anybody's heart. It just made them angry, right? Like, the heart of the students, their hearts weren't changed. Like, you may have had an impact, like an immediate impact, but it didn't actually save the day, right? On the other hand, my daughter could have just said nothing, and that would have been even worse. Like, my daughter actually did, she was at least moving in the right direction. She was at least wanting to engage, to fight for goodness, to bring shalom to chaos. She was wanting to pursue the truth and the right, rather than to do nothing, or just join in the rebellion. So she's, she's moving in the right direction. And see, Esther finds herself in the same situation. And Esther knows this great woman of faith in the text, she knows, eventually she knows. I think at the beginning she's kind of torn. Do I do nothing? Because she can do nothing and probably just, she'll be okay. She's the queen. Like, she'll probably be okay. But should she do nothing? And Mordecai convinces her to do something. But now that she's determined she's going to do something, she has to be very careful about what she does because if she just goes in there and and just says things for what it, it's probably not going to end up a it's not going to change the kingdom it may not even actually work as the kingdom is um like the the king of persia has to save face so he's probably not going to love this idea or this situation right so so now esther has to be very shrewd and she has to be very wise about what she does and so what my family got to talk about uh, last year at Purim was, what does it mean in my daughter's situation to be more shrewd? And so, and it's difficult for somebody, let's see, last year she was, what, 13 years old? And it's a little tricky and it's a little difficult. Just don't mind the siren as it goes by my house in the middle of me filming a video. But she, she doesn't have like, um, my daughter, she, she's 13 years old at the time. She doesn't have like all of this deep life experience or deep wells of wisdom, but we were able to talk about, okay, what's a way that actually 
How can you potentially engage the class, ask people to do the right thing, encourage people to do the right thing, set a particular model? What are all the things that you can do to actually change the culture of the classroom? And it might be slower, it might be less efficient, it might be, but in the long run, it actually changes more hearts, changes more, not just behavior, but changes who we are and impacts lives in more ways than simply writing the teacher and getting the teacher to respond. And you see how that res and you see how that's full of like complexity? Do you see how that's full of ambiguity and gray? It's not black and white. You see, that's what we always want. We always want our life of faith and our decisions and our actions and our we always want it to be clear cut, clearly fit into clear categories. We always want clarity, black and white. Life's not like that. And Purim, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is really straightforward. Sometimes it's not complex. Sometimes you know exactly what you need to do. And praise God when that happens. Uh, and then you just have to respond correctly. But, but sometimes life is unbelievably tricky. And what God invites us to become is shrewd and wise. One more example. I was having a Q&A with a small group the other night, and somebody asked me this really good question. They said, you know, you have this podcast, and you do these videos on YouTube, and you're trying to teach about truth, and you're trying to talk about a Bible, you know, the Bible and having a better reading of the Bible in ways that are going to rub against the status quo in ways that, and they said, and you're a support-based minister. Like you need donors to give to your ministry in order for you and your family to not just, and, and, and there's other people that work with you. Like if you say the wrong thing, you could lose support. People that you employ could lose their jobs. Like they kind of, you know, and that was a wonderful question. And it was the same thing about Purim put on display. I have to figure out, I have to live in that shrewd space. I need, I have to practice wisdom all the time in figuring out what it means to make a difference without just coming in, guns a-blazing, making a huge splash, and kind of essentially screwing up the overall plan. Because Esther could have, in the book of Esther, Esther could have screwed up the whole plan. That could have very easily taken place, right? She could have very easily just gone in there and not saved the Jews and not even saved herself. And she could have been trying to do the right thing and actually screwed up the whole story, right? This is what Purim invites us to learn. Like, don't just go in and, and see our world today does not encourage us. The world of social media asks you to take sides and to be loud about taking sides and to be clear about taking sides. And the world today does not incentivize like acknowledging complexity and nuance. That's a hard thing to do in our world. And we love to force people into corners because you're either on my side or you're not. You're either going to do the right thing or you're going to get canceled. You're either going to... And it is difficult to live in this space where it's like, it's one thing for me to take a stand on Twitter. It's another thing for me to actually make a difference. Right? It's easy for me to sign up and make sure I wear the right jersey... It's another thing to actually bring about the right kind of change in the world. How am I going to do that? And I don't have, like, this YouTube video does not end with some beautiful resolution and some wonderful teaching point and an easy application. This video is here to say this kind of complexity, this kind of unresolved ambiguity is exactly what Purim affirms encourages us to engage with both hands and to remember about our own story. Because our story has been made by people that live in that very space. So that's my reflection for Purim this year. Um, I hope it's compelling, helpful, whatever it might be. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I hope that um, we can keep having more beautiful conversations at the festivals, and the holiday celebrations and stories and the teachings that we find inside of them can continue to teach us and pull us and shape us into the people that God wants us to be. So until the next festival edition conversation, we'll talk to you then.